Yep. Um, so my name is Talik. Um, these guys are saying. So yeah. So I'm originally from India. I moved to Canada like uh, three years back. Uh, I used to live and work in South Africa before that. Um, yeah, I've been in this particular UX uh, domain for the last 10 years, um, right out of my college. Um, and yeah, it's been fun for me. Um, I've so far worked with different product companies, service-based companies, agencies, and different styles. Um, so currently I'm working with a product design studio called Apply Digital um, in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, so today we'll be Kind of, uh, I, I wouldn't say we are going to learn anything about accessibility. I just want to like sort of start um, or start teaching people about accessibility. So we'll we'll kind of see some of the important things about as accessibility, like like why it is important, and, and why we need to consider that as a designer. And uh, rather than actually learning like what kind of things that we should consider, I thought we can probably do a couple of exercises to actually put ourselves in the other spectrum and uh, see whether we can actually use some of the tools that we created um, can be used in the same way that that, that, that especially able users can actually do. Um, so that's the aim of this session today. So I'm gonna start sharing my screen quickly, okay? Mm. Yep. Let me know if you guys can see my screen. Yep, we can. Yes. Mm, nice. Yeah. Um, cool. So let's talk about accessibility. But does does anyone know why accessibility is called as A W N Y? No. Uh, so it's 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 basically called it's basically a, a numeronym where the number eleven refers to the uh, the number of letters that has been omitted. So because accessibility is a branch where we are trying to make the designs accessible for users, right? Like everybody can use it. It's not only for normal people. Like anybody who has a special condition can also still use the design that we create. Uh, but, uh, so that is why the word accessibility, we just basically removed all the letters in between A and Y and uh, we introduced the number 11. Uh, so it's basically, so any type of word that they actually introduce numbers is called a new numeronym. So that's why accessibility, um, like recently, or I would say like a lot of people use A, double O, and Y to actually represent accessibility. Um, so with that, we will probably keep over this one. Yeah, so as I was saying, accessibility is basically an inclusive practice um, where we are trying to make all users can actually use any kind of websites or app or any products that we develop, or it could be even a service, um, uh, can actually use it um, without any kind of like issues in any kind of scenario. So that is that is the, basically what accessibility means. So when we usually design uh, something, uh, I'm guessing most of the colleges or even like uh, uh, boot camps, they never teach you much about accessibility or they don't include accessibility as part of the curriculum. They should talk about the usability and the visual design or UI design part. Uh, and uh, so we all know like, yeah, the usability is a part where we think about uh, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and and, uh, and, and and like how it can help user to improve the performance. And uh, the design, the UI design part. Um, is, so this is where we kind of think about like how satisfying it is to use and, uh, and, and, and how we can create some of the meaningful, delightful experiences for the user. Um, so the, so I, I would say the best user experience actually comes out when you can actually make a product usable uh, and it actually looks and feels good and it also like accessible. Uh, because accessibility uh, for me, it's actually the most important one because that is the part where you can actually make the design more inclusive. Um, so that is where um, a particular uh, product that you're actually working on uh, can actually allow all types of user uh, to actually use the product or your app or website without having any kind of issues. Uh, so to be a, to actually produce great experiences, I would say we definitely have to consider all of three these three buckets, uh, which we usually don't. Yeah. Uh, so the reason, yeah, why? Uh, so this is actually from from WHO. Uh, so 15 percent or like more than 1 billion people in, in, in the current world population actually live with some sort of disabilities. 
Um, so that's like actually a huge chunk, right? So if you don't actually make your designs accessible, uh, you be, we are actually like leaving out huge amount of population and these people basically won't be able to use your tool. Um, so that's actually pretty sad for me personally. I don't know about you guys. Um, so if you see uh, what are the different types of uh, um, like uh, disabilities, I think this is pretty much um, we have been exposed to there are like cognitive disabilities, visual disabilities, hearing and motor. So, so, so what kind of things that can affect when it comes to like cognitive disabilities, I would say like a memory processing speed, uh, time management, uh, letters, uh, language, uh, numbers, symbols, math. So those kind of things, uh, so people cannot process them well. Uh, so same for like uh, when it comes to visual, so color, contrast, font size and weight. So those kind of things will actually affect uh, people's performance and hearing we all know so partial or like complete ear loss and uh, uh, so finally motor related skills so where people uh, cannot maybe they have a traumatic injury or it could be like a motor related disease or like special conditions or maybe it could be like because of old age so these are the different types of issues which people suffer from uh, to which we have to account um, in our designs and uh, so it's a, it is not just for these four categories if you actually see the uh, like as we are growing old, the things, the, the stuff that we actually used much more easier when we were young, for example, games, which we can actually play much more faster when we're young. As we are growing older and older, our reflexes actually like slow down and we were not, and currently we won't be able to play the same speed that we were actually able to do sometime past. Um, so it's actually for people who are like growing old, people actually using different types of devices, uh, people uh, having temporary disabilities, maybe they had an accident, um, and um, uh, people who have who actually have like less uh, situational limitations, maybe they have like bright sunlight on their screen, um, maybe they have like too much noise around them, they're not able to listen to the audio. Um, so it could be like different kinds of things which which typically do not even fall under these four categories. Which so I would say accessibility can actually help you improvise the the design even for the normal set of users uh, whom we actually design for. Yeah, so apart from being inclusive, yeah, so we, we typically try to include accessibility as part of our design because, yep, we definitely want to be inclusive. We want to make our particular design uh, accessible for all types of users. Uh, but why again? So this is actually one of the uh, reports from a, from a site called UsableNet. So these are the number of lawsuits that people have filed uh, on, on like, it could be a website, it could be a mobile app. So it could be like any type of product or service that, that I'm, a person and this this particular product or service is not is not actually accessible to me so if you can see it's actually raising and raising it's going high and higher and these are some other brands uh, which have actually went under lawsuits and they have to do some like multi-million dollar settlement either like inside the court or outside the court uh, to actually get out of the situation because they're basically their product or their website was not accessible and and some person was not able to use them to actually complete their action um, so with that, let's probably start with um, an exercise, which um, I would like to call as text to speech. So if you have an Android and iPhone, yeah, just, just grab it out. And uh, so if you have an iPhone, just, just go to your settings, uh, accessibility, and uh, turn on uh, your, your voiceover. Yeah. And if you have Android phone, you can see the instructions. Sorry, I'm not an Android user, so I've just put up instructions for Android users. Um, so yeah, so go to your device settings app, accessibility and text to speech output. Uh, so if you basically turn on that. Voice over on. So you, should, so you, should, be, so you should be able to hear this Double kind of. tap to toggle setting. So if you tap once, uh, the device would actually read what you're tapping on. If you tap twice, uh, it would actually perform the action for you. Um, so you can actually turn on, maybe you can practice for a couple of minutes. Oh, okay. So you can, you can actually practice for a couple of minutes. And uh, and once you guys think you have practiced enough, I, I want you guys to close your eyes. Uh, let's all pretend that we have some kind of like vision impairment. And uh, I want you guys to go to your camera app and take a selfie. with this particular setting zone. 7.46 PM. And- uh, Hold, move down, alert. 
Access selected. Voice over. Voice over off. This thing is driving me crazy. I mean, so imagine, imagine this. This is what these people have to do. To I'm actually. getting crazy too. Yeah, so, yeah so, so these people actually interact with the phone like this every day. So, so imagine if you actually don't have proper commands, proper labelings uh, in your app. And uh, so that means they won't be able to actually interact with your app properly. They won't be able to complete the tasks. And since this is like Apple, uh, that, that's why I, I gave you a very, very simple exercise. Apple, Apple actually follows strict, strict accessibility guidelines. And uh, we usually struggle even, even, even with this particular simple task, right? If you guys are very like, interesting. Yeah, if you guys are like practice, maybe you can like close your eyes and, and, and try to just uh, use the camera. You're right. Okay, so yeah, if you guys are, uh, if you guys done practicing, yeah, just close your eyes and uh, probably take a selfie. Uh, go into the camera app. Uh, maybe you can switch the <laughs> the phone camera to front and then and then you can take a selfie picture. And once you're done, yeah, let me know. And uh, we can probably have a small discussion about uh, how was the experience. Near bottom right edge. I don't know what Near is happening with Siri. So yeah, okay. Camera chaser. Near okay, so uh, yeah, if you guys ever want to exit from the accessibility mode in iPhone, you can actually tap three times on the power button, and uh, and uh, it should give you a menu like this. Oh, okay. And, yeah, sure. Yeah. So if you actually tap it three times, so you would see a menu which would like pop pop from the bottom, and then mm -hmm. and then. You can tap on voiceover to cancel the accessibility mode. Screen dim. How do you go home? That's one thing I couldn't figure out uh, on the yeah. iPhone. You you want to go to go to the home page? Yeah. Voiceover on settings. I guess, accessibility. I guess. So if you want to cancel the accessibility settings, you can do the triple click on the side and you would get the menu and you can like tap on the voiceover to cancel it. But if you want to go to the home page, even in the accessibility mode, you can just do a do a do like a swipe up and it should take you to the home page. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And what happened with the with the gestures? Because this, my swipe was not working. So I couldn't go to the camera because all my icons are behind. I have in the, the new um the new um iphone version ios versions okay so yeah i couldn't i couldn't done anything it's, it's super confusing 
<laughs> okay, good to know. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are actually facing issues for the first time. Uh, um, Hallie, you know, I had one quick question. Is it also possible to ask like Siri um, with an iPhone or even ask a basic <laughs> Samsung to go to accessibility or is that kind of cheap? <laughs> Yeah, you can you, you can you can do it if you want, but but this will actually give you like much more real experience because those guys are not always not going to use voice commands, right? Uh, imagine yeah, imagine if you're from outside US, then your your accent or your tone might not be right for the Siri. And in those guys, if that is the case, then they would be definitely using tap over voice commands. Okay. Yeah. So many of us don't even consider this when we actually design our system. So, so that's kind of like, yeah. I mean, I was not big, big on accessibility as well, to be frank, when, when I was like doing designs. Uh, and, then, and then probably I would say in the last few years, that is when I started picking up on accessibility uh, uh, because I, I was working with Target and that is when at first uh, I was like surprised um, when they told me that after doing your designs, uh, don't even go to the developers for review, go to the accessibility team. Um, so I had to, had to like go to the accessibility team, uh, show them my wireframes, uh, and then they would do a review. And then I'll go to the development team to see if they're okay with it. Um, and then, so I had, a, I, had, I had like a big discussion with the accessibility designer there. And he was the one who explained me, who took me, um, who actually made me do exercises like this to, to make me understand why it is important. Um, so that is when I, I, I had like a, I had like an aha moment. And uh, yeah, from that time, we kind of- Okay, thank you. Did she say something? Oh, okay. Yeah, so that is when I would say we started like uh, introducing accessibility, at least personally into the, uh, uh, design behavior. Uh, so we kind of like embed accessibility into our design process. Uh, we kind of like start leaving notes for the developers and for the UI designers, like why certain things needs to be designed because it's, it needs to be addressed in the, in the accessibility. Uh, so I would say that's definitely a good practice, which uh, I'm still learning more about accessibility, uh, but uh, um, this is something which could seriously affect a lot of brands because uh, now uh, accessibility has been uh, made like mandatory by like a lot of governments as well. So there's like a lot of guidelines. There's a lot of like uh, governments which are like strict on accessibility. Um, so, and moreover, it's good to be inclusive um, than actually designing for like a strictly for audience. So did you guys manage to take a picture? No? Yes? How many people I, have failed? How many people I failed with the half of my head, my eye. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's good to know at least you got an eye so how was the experience like uh, does anybody want to share i think kate kate done it sita done it too i can share yeah um so i actually had to do this activity during grad school on being um vision impairment while interacting with the phone, but this was worse. I had a, one of the tasks involved going through my bin app and trying to um, send like a like on a post. <laughs> so I had to go through YouTube tutorial training on how to make that work. <laughs> um, I would say one of the tricky part is when it comes to um, swiping through screens, um, you have to double tap each time for going through the apps. And the hard part, I would say my phone when it came to scrolling is using the carousel when swiping through. Um, so one of the only best picture I could do as a selfie of myself was just kind of a bit of a half face. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was an interesting activity and it also made me have um, a lot of like empathy and sympathy for people who are trying to use their phone while visually blind. 
So, um, but I really like the exercise. It's just, I could see with the mobile devices, there needs to be some improvement with interactions more. Yeah, it's, it's even like worse on like a, a, a website or a web app because mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's like, because tapping in the small device is much more easier. Imagine you right. have like a big, big screen, right. and you have to like tap on like hundreds of links, which lives in like a single page. Uh, imagine a, a, a visually impaired person going to target website and trying oh, to yeah. do, yeah. So that's like yeah. night, right? Uh, yeah, so especially if you want to order things online, um, that becomes a really tedious task, especially if you have to go through a lot of the online ordering prompts. Yep, totally, totally. I agree. Good um, point. Is that why like the people should start adding like uh, descriptions for images, provide like proper alt text, provide proper like labels for system, provide proper headings for pages and, you know, um, like have like a proper um, accessibility DOM structure. Um, so it's, yeah, so, 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 so those kind of things would, is what's going to help uh, like interactions like this to be like much more smoother because every tap they do, system can give some kind of feedback because if there is no label for, for the system to study, it can't tell you like what it's, what it's seeing or what they're tapping on. Maybe they're tapping on something right, but there's no label to support it. Now they can't, they can't perform the action. Um, so that's why. That's true. Yeah, in, in a lot of, lot of designs that we do, we think about like, oh, I'm gonna make it like super cool, aesthetically minimalistic designs that does we make the sizes smaller, bigger, everything. Uh, but we don't think about like these kind of scenarios. Um, so that is when, when you actually use it, that's when you kind of get a reality check, which I would say. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Oh, I wanted to add one quick thing. Also <laughs> when they're trying to like um, tap on each thing, it would be helpful if like, let's say if you landed on radio button designs, mm -hmm. you get to make it a little more bigger because we interact with our thumbs. Yeah. You're right. Thank you, Sita. Does anyone want to share? Liz, Leticia, Max. Yeah, I'm. I'm thinking like uh, it's. It's interesting. Like it, it, instead of to see an icon, I have to hear what it means to be an icon. What is the name of that icon? You know, like you know what I mean. Like it's the, the turning the camera to the front from the back. It's it's a whole experience and sweep from the other screens as well is kind of tricking an iPhone in the last update, yeah. Yeah, totally. Pretty in incredible for me. Pretty neat, right? So I, I I actually played with this for like half, for like maybe like four or five hours. So I, I, I decided like one day, I'm gonna use my phone like this, like the whole day. I, I was like, okay, let's see if I can like last like one whole day, like, yeah. Uh, maybe I can still see so that I know where I tap, right? But I couldn't last more than like four hours. Like I was like, nope, I'm, I'm not doing this. <laughs> this is like too much for me. Uh, but uh, yeah, we need to learn again, right? It's to learn again how to use a phone this way. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of like a, I would say for me it was like too much. I couldn't take it. And then I realized oh, this is this this is actually the ways that few people actually interact with your phones or websites or whatsoever. So um, then then it makes me sad. Uh, but but glad. But uh, yeah, I think probably we can get we can get ask somebody else to share like the last one, and then we can go to the next exercise if anybody wants to share. Yeah, I think um, that was probably the biggest takeaway for me is just how fundamentally different the experience is. Right, like we're so used to interacting with our phones a certain way and then all of a sudden it's like a completely new way of interacting i i couldn't even take a picture i was so lost <laughs> <laughs> yeah just need some practice man yeah uh thank you for sharing that max so let's, let's just probably go to the next exercise um the next one is kind of like simple you guys get to keep your vision this time but 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 we are going to take away your mouse. So yeah, close maybe like yeah, uh, like open your email. Like everything you had to do only using your keyboard. I wanted to open a new tab, open your email, log in, and then and then and then send an email probably with a hi message with probably with a small attachment in it. Okay, uh, to 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 my email ID or something, whatever. If you guys don't want to send the email ID, at least like send send the email to your own email ID. It's fine. Um, but yeah, but cannot use your mouse, 
not even to open your tab. Yeah, you, you have to do everything only using your keyboard. And please don't don't close the Zoom call. <laughs> we don't want to lose you. <laughs> yeah, don't close your Zoom calls if you're in browsers. Yeah, just use your keyboard completely to do this task. Oh gosh, no mouse, no. No mouse. No, don't use your mouse. <laughs> use your keyboard. <laughs> I just turned on the mouse. Okay, let's try. I want to go over Zoom. Yeah, so you have to you have to open, <laughs> no, open another thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah. there, I'm there. It's easy. Really? Easy PC, yes. Oh gosh. Okay. Oh, but now it's starting to I guess, I guess people who used uh, yeah, Windows it should be easy for them. <laughs> Oh, I have it here. Hello. Easy, done it. Oh, software engineer alert. <laughs> <laughs> Go, developer. <laughs> No mouse. I'm also, no mouse. So I'm also trying to open my email <laughs> without using mouse. And... No, I couldn't. Okay. Yeah, I cannot get out of Zoom either. Uh, can you like probably use tab? No? I can send the email from here in the chat if you want. Okay, it's okay. You can use your mouse at least to open one Chrome browser. I'll, I'll probably allow it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm stuck. I don't know how to attach. Attachment? I don't know how to select the attach button. <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't know which email you're using, but. Uh... Outlook. I mean, no, I'm using mail. I use Outlook for work, but. My personal stuff, I use just Apple Mail. Uh, I mean, if you're using Outlook, oh, you should, it could, yeah, if you use tab, you should be able to go to your uh, attachment button and then, really? and then. I tried that. Let me try again. Uh, okay, that's what that's what I'm doing, and and then. Oh, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Good to know. I'm glad. Oh gosh, how can you go back? In the shift, shift, tab. shift, shift, tab. shift, shift, good. So, um, Sita is stuck on the Gmail, on Gmail to recipient. Okay, oh. I think if you, if you press tab, I think you go through the mail set to the web page component. But Zoom, Zoom is very bad, no? Have these two screens, it's difficult to go back to the, to the call. But Liz, you, okay, yeah, Liz, so you did it first, but there's no attachment in your email. Oh, I forgot, I can do it again. You have to attach something in the email? Yeah, let's see, because I guess okay. everybody can actually go to the email, but let's see if you can okay. like navigate between attachments, open your dialogue window, attach a file, come back, you know? Oh, yeah, okay, let's try again. Oh, it is hilarious. I am in my in my work laptop and I have only confidential things. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. No worries. The attachment. Yeah. Send me send me the send me the most important file. Okay. <laughs> Gosh. 
Okay, Come on, I don't want to search. Okay, let's search. Okay, I'm stuck. I give up. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> okay. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> but, but imagine somebody is actually sending email like this every day, not just email. They're literally doing everything on the computer when they're using keyboard. Mm. And now, can I, how can I select this? Come on. <laughs> Are you going to tell us how to do it? <laughs> no, go figure it out. <laughs> no, you have to do it. Yeah. We are all waiting. Oh, we for have that. to Google it. I think. I'm just going to use Siri. I think. I think it depends on the OS and as well as the mail clients. Like, how do you open drawers? How do you open menu? But usually, it should be available on like tab, space bar, uh, and the enter. So you should be able to interact with uh, like minimal. You should be able to interact. Uh, with the system using these, these three buttons because spacebar would allow you to actually focus on each items without actually entering it and same with tab as well and uh, and uh, either it, like return or enter should should be able to allow you to open up the menus or perform the action uh, so usually these three buttons should be able to allow you to perform an action if it is not allowing maybe there's something wrong with the system hmm. okay how much more time do we have sorry how much more time do we have it's okay we can we can try for some time no problem yeah i mean if you guys want to see then probably you guys can also like google it no problem we are not leaving here until everyone gets this. Oh. <laughs> Nobody is leaving until I get everybody's email. Nobody's leaving. Yes. And I attached. Okay, I got I got an attachment from list as well. Okay. Good job. Great. Thank you for the audio icons. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. Oh, wow. Okay. Good job, Kate. Thank you. It's interesting, right? To, I know it's also weird to not use your mouse. Um, that, that is actually an extreme version of this, this particular exercise. Um, where we try to combine two different disabilities, basically motor disability and actual as, uh, and also intellectual disability. So basically after every tap, you have to wait 30 seconds to process the data. Mm. Uh, so people with like intellectual disabilities, they might not be able to pick up your icon. So they might spend a couple of seconds or maybe like 10 seconds to understand what is it, or they might have visual imperatives. So they have to like look at each item as they're going through. So we mix things and we make this exercise extremely like difficult also, but that kind of like drives people into like nuts. So <laughs> let's not do that. But basically imagine spending like 10 minutes just to send like one email with the word hello. So that's what happens. Um, and, and that's actually a real life case. Like I've seen users who are who actually does that. They have to wait um, probably like 10, 15 seconds after doing something because they, they need some time to process what they have done or what system is doing. If anyone else is using Gmail, I have an issue with opening up the or hitting the compose button, and then my composer just collapses into a window that I can't access. <laughs> I don't know if anyone else has had that problem, but 
It's killing me right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, Google. Yeah, with Gmail. I'm facing issues when you type in someone else's email address into the to section of Gmail. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it just won't let me type your email. It's crazy. Yeah, in Gmail. Yeah, imagine, imagine now we have to go and add somebody in the BCC. That's like always like even like collapse. Oh, that's like even more crazy. <laughs> The first time, uh, yeah, I think, I think the yeah, first time uh, uh, somebody asked me to do this, yeah, I think I think I nearly cried because I couldn't do do this. <laughs> it was crazy. I was like, nope. If you're gonna ask me to do this, I will probably quit the job because I couldn't finish the job. Like, yeah, and it was like, what like the email clients a few years back, and and there's there, yeah, nobody knew what was accessibility at that point. Um, so there was like literally not, nothing there. Ooh. Okay, okay, I got like four or five emails. That's good. That's good. Yeah. So, so what are the difficulties, some of the difficulties that you guys think or faced? Uh, like, yeah, not with the application, but like, like what kind of things that you guys felt, which kind of like maybe drove you into nuts? <laughs> Yeah, I think it's using the commands or ship command or option, DAP, the combination of those. Fair enough. I mean, I would say we don't even, like half of the people doesn't even know how to use a keyboard and navigate uh, because we have so gotten used with uh, touch system, all of our touch pads and mouse. And uh, so now if they ask to use the keyboard, the only thing that they do is actually to type something but they never navigate using the keyboard and maybe as designers we do we do a lot of like shortcuts you know figma files or sketch files or whatsoever um, so we are kind of like fancy with that but even even among our community we still struggle to use our keyboard to just send an email with a hello um, yeah so that kind of tells us something that there are people who actually struggle <laughs> But uh, if you are done, uh, probably next, I just want to show something else. Um, so have you guys ever heard of a, a, a widget called uh, um, No Coffee? Has anybody heard of it? No? Okay. So, so, yeah, so it's, it's actually um, a small widget which you can like add on into your Chrome. So I'm going to like stop sharing and maybe share something. Okay, how do I do it? Yeah. Um, Okay, so no coffee is a widget which allows allows you to experience um, some of the uh, impairment issues uh, that people actually face. Um, so I'm going to show you a small example. So you can you, you can actually like use it within your office to actually like uh, probably evangelize about uh, accessibility if if people are not refusing to put any effort into this. So if, can can I guys see my uh, screen? It, you guys should be able to see the target website, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, if you actually add the no coffee into your browser, you guys should be able to get a small, um, a small widget like this. So so this is actually a plugin which you can install, and basically this allows you to experience like a couple of like different types of like visual impairments, like people who have like blurriness in their eyes. Um, so if you actually like in, in, Including, like increase the blurriness, you can literally see the website. So this is what the sites might look for a few people. Like maybe yeah, if, I, if I remove my glasses, this is what it's going to look like for me too. So I'm actually like kind of like visually impaired as well. Um, so you can, you can also kind of ch check and see uh, different kinds of like color blindness. So if you see, this is like for people with like, what is the name? Put on up here, normally, yeah. So yeah, so you can, you can literally see how different kinds of people seeing different colors because that's one of the things that we actually have now gotten so comfortable with using colors to uh, showcase different statuses, different items, different messages, whatsoever. Uh, we just use like a small icon to represent, but imagine somebody seeing the screen like this. 
Uh, this is basically a, a issue where they don't see any kind of color. And now they don't know whether you're saying something or not, right? Um, well, yeah, similar thing. Yeah, if they're seeing only red, maybe they're seeing only green. Who knows? Maybe they're seeing only like orange. Um, so you can actually play around with this widget. So in this particular one, it's basically for people who have like blocked vision. So people who, who can't see anything in the center of the screen, peripheral wow. visions, corner, corner vision, side vision, yeah, large spots on the screen, and then probably like, yeah. So yeah, free, uh, probably you can, you can like download this particular widget player on this should probably give you a personal experience of how people actually struggle when you design. Um, and um, yeah, this should encourage at least us personally. This is one of the tools which um, I actually use to uh, showcase to a couple of clients also sometimes uh, to actually convince them, no, we need to introduce labels because users might not understand what is this icon if we just change the color. Um, so those kind of things, what we can do. So okay, I'm gonna start sharing. This is actually an interesting widget, which I thought I should share with you guys. Um, try it out when you have free time. And uh, yeah, so before we end, I just want to share some of the tools or widgets or some of the links which I use uh, on my day-to-day -day practice uh, to ensure that at least I consider maybe I won't be able to like make my product 100% accessible, but uh, at least the max I can. Um, so I'll just showcase the links now. You guys see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to design, I use these three different uh, tools. So one is so I'll probably share the PDF with Letitia later. So don't worry. This one should have the links and everything. But uh, so the first one is called the color contrast uh, triangulation. So it's basically, the website where you can uh, introduce a text color, background color, and uh, uh, link color, and it should it should tell you instantly whether uh, the colors are accessible or not against like different backgrounds and everything. Uh, so that's actually a very good tool for us to use. And copy reading level, it's actually called the Hemingway app. Um, so it's specific for copy. Uh, if, you, if you use the tool, it will tell you whether your, whether your copy is like dense or not. So if it's like super dense to read, if it's like too long, um, imagine you're using the text-to-speech and there's like a one whole paragraph of copy just to explain one small icon. Um, you know? so, so this particular app will actually help you to eliminate unwanted copy from your product or service or whatsoever. And the SART is a tool which you can embed into uh, Figma, Sketch, and Adobe. Uh, so that should help you to design um, uh, with accessibility in mind because you, you, are, you, you can actually use the tool to quickly check your design because you're going to have so many tools. Uh, but that's actually a very interesting tool. Uh, they have a presentation um, which should allow you to check uh, three different parameters easily. Yeah. Uh, so for auditing, um, for like a for like a full web page auditing or like an app auditing, whatever is it? So I use the tools like Site Info or Wave. You can even use like a accessibility tools, which is which is like I guess it's like eleven dollars, but it's like worth then like a nice thing uh, where you can do a complete audit uh, from from like the whole accessibility guideline based on the guidelines that that the government has come to set. So and finally. Even like, yeah, you could do tons of audit, tons of design work and everything, but I would recommend everybody to develop or use this particular checklist as a base, um, um, which you can use to actually check out icons and okay, I've taken care of this. Uh, always use access to, access to the checklist to actually verify whether the design meets the criteria or not. Um, so with this, probably, I think I'll end my session today. Hope I was able to help or provide some level of knowledge for you guys about accessibility. But um, yeah, um, probably in future, um, in case if I get an opportunity again, I'll probably like talk about some of the techniques or trips or things that we have to uh, keep in mind when we actually design uh, for accessibility. Um, yeah, so you guys have any questions, anything? I have one. Um... I'd be curious to know from your experience just how, how is accessibility thought through when scoping out a project? Obviously there's special considerations to be made, maybe it takes extra time to implement those considerations. How is that kind of sort of thought through in, uh, in scoping out the project? I, I, so yeah, so, so that's why I said like most of the people don't even think about this. So this is not even considered um, in, in, in the initial scope. 
of like, a, let's just say, so in, at, at least in my company currently, uh, so this is actually part of the design practice. Uh, so, so we have like heavily uh, templatized, like how we should actually drop our notes into our, in, into our uh, Figma documents or sketch documents, whatever is it. Uh, we also have it as part of the practice, like, hey, once we do the design, you have to use your accessibility tools to actually check um, your contrast. Maybe you have to check your copy. Uh, maybe you have to check uh, whatever that you need to check. Uh, maybe we have a checklist, as I said, uh, we would actually use the checklist. So we we drop notes to the UI designer and, and that notes gets carried over to the developers as well. So in that manner, we always know that the accessibility guidelines or the hints that we are doing uh, gets carried over all the way. But uh, uh, when it comes to scoping, yes, since now we started considering accessibility, at least in my company, uh, we kind of like add additional time uh, for us to work through uh, accessibility. But most of the companies I've worked, uh, they do not. Uh, but there are like some mature companies or companies which in case the companies which you saw in the list which i shared uh, which has faced lawsuits like target where i was working on they have a separate accessibility team so that actually parts of the that, that that's actually like embedded into their practice now so as i was saying once the ux team or design team does their design it has to go to the accessibility team for a sign off uh, so so now since it's part of a practice then they usually like scope it down they add the timeline and the budget for that as well um, so I would say, yeah, start evangelizing about accessibility within your community or your company or your team and, uh, and, uh, and see how we can like introduce that slowly because yeah, you can't like drop a bomb on the whole thing. Maybe you can like start introducing it slowly. Uh, maybe uh, there'll be like different levels how we can like introduce that. And that's what I would say. Thank you, Max. Okay. And how is your experience applying with the uh, convince your company to apply this accessibility? Oh, uh, I mean, we have like a much more bigger accessibility freaks, I would say, in my team. Uh, like, like I, if you actually consider my knowledge, I, I would say like those guys are like somebody whom, whom I look up to. Um, so, so I didn't, I didn't have to like evangelize anything. Um, so we, have, so we have like designers. Um, Probably we have like actually like five designers in the team who are like so much um, strict or like uh, about accessibility or about having designs which are like super inclusive. Um, they check everything from copy to size to everything. So they do not allow, they or they would not sign off designs if it is like beyond certain text, text or like font size. Okay. So, so those guys are somebody whom I always go to uh, in, if, if I need some help about accessibility or any kind of thought process or anything. Um, but uh, but in my current company, um, I never. I, I would say I had more help. I didn't have to do anything from scratch. I actually had help from those guys. Um, uh, and now it's good. We actually use, uh, as I said, we have access as part of our design process. Um, we are using tools. We invest uh, money to actually uh, buy a couple of tools. As I said, like uh, uh, string. So that one was one which you can buy as well. Um, so. In that way, I would say in my current company, I'm a little bit more blessed than many other guys. <laughs> yeah. So, Harry, I have a question. What happened with uh, when you are in a company that uh, their branding, for example, was made long time ago? You can't change it, and the colors they are using they are they they are not comply with the accessibility rules. So, what do you do in that case? What what can you do? So I mean, I had that experience. Uh, I would say in, in 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 one of my recent projects where there was like tons of accessibility issues. Um, and yeah, so so one one couple of things what we did was we basically ran an accessibility check and we told them these are the list of issues that you guys actually have. Um, and uh, uh, so that would actually give them sort of like a reality check if they can see, because if you run an accessibility check using Wave, okay, it, it will tell you that you have like hundreds of issues and it can literally point down every issue in the website. Um, so that would give them sort of like a reality check. So second one that we do is actually, uh, we kind of do accessibility checks on their competitors as well. Uh, like if, uh, so yeah, so one more tool that you can use is also like Google Lighthouse. Um, I don't know if you guys ever use Google Lighthouse. So you can actually go into the, inspect mode so um i can actually do it quickly for you guys because you guys are interested to see how it works <laughs> you guys have like a couple of more minutes time i can actually <laughs> share my screen and show it again yeah, yeah we have so 
Can you guys see my screen, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you are, if you're, if you're using a Chrome browser, I would usually say do it in the ex, uh, in, in incognito mode. But uh, if you're in the Chrome browser view, right click, go to inspect mode, okay? And then, uh, yeah, you, you can have a mobile view, desktop view, whatever that is. And if you actually go to this part of the page, you can see uh, this, this particular like double chevron, double arrow icon, right? If you click it, you will see a small option which is called Lighthouse in the drop down. So Google Lighthouse is actually a tool developed by Google to measure the performance of the website. Um, so they, they actually measure the performance, uh, the, the, the progressiveness, the best practices, and the accessibility, and uh, SEO practices. So you can you can like generate the report, and uh, yeah, it sort of like runs for like a couple of minutes or whatever. It's, it's, I would say it's ideal to use uh, in like a super incognito mode when you have like all other browsers shut down. We have like a very good internet connection. Use it because the internet connection can sort of like affect uh, how much of the score as well. So it sort of like runs different tests on the website uh, with like uh, low internet, high bandwidth. Then it would like sort of like cut the connection and everything, and it would give you a score. So this particular score is kind of like a good 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 evaluation, I would say. Um, um, so through this through this particular tool, uh, we actually measure the uh, accessibility of like my current client and as well as with their competitors and tell them, you know what, if you see the competitors, everybody has a very good accessibility score, and uh, that means that means those, those competitors are actually being more inclusive uh, when it comes to their clientele. Whereas like your website has like a super bad accessibility score, so people cannot use your website. So that is like another way through which we can actually like recommend them to, to, to approach a much more accessibility based approach. So if you see this, yeah, now we can see like uh, the performance of the website could be bad because right now I have like so much of uh, content open and doing a screen share and everything, right? So it may increase if I actually close everything. Uh, but you can actually see the other scores. And uh, as I said, Target has like a very good accessibility score. They have like a score of 91. Sorry, 97, so which is actually like super good. Um, so I would recommend also using this tool. Um, and this tool also gives break breakdown. So it, it just not, not give you the score. It also like gives you breakdown of different items, which can be like improvised. What are the issues they can like pinpoint, uh, which you can like, uh, yeah, hand over uh, to your dev team. Maybe you can uh, have a discussion on those issues um, and uh, see how you can fix it as well. So uh, that is like one more important tool which you can also use. And uh, mostly clients, I would say they would be open the moment you say them, uh, say things like, yeah, uh, your website is not inclusive. Clients are not going to uh, use your website because it's basically not being uh, accessible. And uh, yeah, if, if at all they're not listening, you can always like, drop the lawsuit bomb on them. Like if, an, if a person with special need comes and if you can't use it, they can actually like, <laughs> they can actually like sue your website or your product or what is it and uh, yeah and yeah pretty much you can see like like this uh, last year alone there were like 3700 cases uh, of lawsuits just on like accessibility so pretty much they would be convinced at this point pardon how many cases did you say how many lawsuits were there uh in 2020 there were around like 3700 lawsuits in the is that the u.s I guess so. I think I think it's it's just from the US um, uh, because I think the usable net uh, they collect data from the US. I believe it's from US because uh, the most of the lawsuits I checked um, they were like predominantly from US as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I believe so. I'm not sure, but I can check and I can like ping in the channel. Um, but I think they are from the US. Okay. I but actually I, have another question. Yeah. Um, my boss act was asking uh, this week, interestingly enough, and he asked the team, like, do, if anyone knew what, um, if Google Analytics can detect screen readers. Sorry? It was, um, can Google Analytics detect screen readers? I thought that was a weird question. I don't know. I didn't think so, but. I have no clue as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea as well whether Google Analytics. Okay, that's actually an interesting question for me. Now I'm going to do some research on that. Can Google Analytics read screen readers? Well, apparently it can. Oh, really? 
Alpha. But it's not easy. But apparently, it's not easy. So normally they, they don't include, but uh, there, is a, there is a Reddit track which says it can. But if you see uh, the major articles, which pops up in the first couple of pages, it says they can't because yeah. the screen readers are not user agents. So yeah, that's what they're saying. But there's this, this one, one particular thread which says it can. So maybe, maybe I'm going to go and probably explore that because you dropped a big question, which is actually super interesting for me now. Cool. <laughs> And I'm wondering why why your boss is interested in that because so do they want to know how many people are using screen readers or because you can you can infer maybe that from with the age or I don't know that's a good question um we just had our weekly dev meeting and then he was saying we need to make things more accessible we already did the first round of making it I think single A instead of like there's double, different standards. There's double A, and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he just he asked that question. So. Interesting. I will take a look too. Yeah, me oh, too. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Great. Okay. Any other question before we finish? I have one if it's all right. Yeah. So um, I was really curious, earlier in your presentation, you had talked about sort of the different impairments that any given individual might have. I'm curious to know what kind of the thought process is behind what specifically you're gonna tackle in accessibility. Do you try to cover all bases or are you more intentional around who your target audience is? How do you sort of think through what you're gonna tackle and whatnot? So mostly uh, we just follow the the accessibility guidelines, which is which which should cover up most of the thing. Because because if you see, um, yeah, for like for like visually impaired people, so we kind of like tend to take care of the color contrast and the fonts, right? Um, so if you can like fix or play around with those things, then 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 you should be able to provide a good uh, website for them or whatsoever. So and we also and if you see the current technologies like both with uh, web based or even with your uh, uh, phones or something uh, not, the, the accessibility options have actually become better and better nowadays um the, the, there are actually like sites uh, for example just hold on i'm going to show you a small um, site um and there are like a lot of accessibility tools so you don't even have to like plug in you, you can actually like buy these tools and plug it into your website um and these tools can be used by the users so just hold on i'm going to share my screen once again yeah so this is actually a website uh, of uh, uh, yeah for uh, Mastermind Toy. I don't know if you guys know this company. Yeah, uh, you look, just look at the company. It's like all over the place, right? Yeah, you know, I'm like hundred percent sure this this website is not accessible. They have like because it's a it's basically a toys website, so they need to be careful. But that means uh, it's going to be like all over the place. So the, the web, web accessibility would be like so bad. So that is the reason why if you see on the right side of the sorry, the left side of the screen, they have this accessibility tool. If you actually like click on this, so it should give you mm. all of the accessibility options. So accessibility option uh, or the tool sets have like, uh, it, it has become better and better. Uh, so you have like different ways through which you can actually tackle um, uh, accessibility problems. But the best uh, uh, process, at least for us as a designers to actually feel much more happier with ourselves would say, yeah, definitely try to cover all of the bases because you can't like target. Maybe um, if, if you have like a special user segment, let's just say um, you are doing something for like old people. Yeah. Maybe, maybe that is when you, you have to probably like uh, have, uh, I mean, even, even in that particular segment, imagine old people, maybe they would be able to, they wouldn't be able to see properly. They wouldn't have proper motor controls. Uh, maybe they might have a couple of like intellectual problems, like they might not be able to like remember stuff properly. So even if that is the case, I would say it's better to cover all the bases. So because you wouldn't know who's actually using um, your product or your services, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so that's what I'm saying, like have a checklist so that, so that you kind of like cover everything. So you, you're not leaving anybody out. 
I think Netflix got sued by uh, people who had like a um, hearing impairment because they oh, said, gosh. Uh, because yeah, they didn't have like closed captions or something. Uh, so that's interesting aspect. Netflix should get sued for raising their prices again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, check out, check out tools like this, um, which you can also like buy and plug in into your website. If you're doing website design and uh, you need to like uh, do something which might not meet your accessibility criteria, then maybe this could be an option for users to actually make the websites accessible for them. Awesome, yes. thank you. Okay. And thank you for the awesome presentation. This is great. Yeah. Oh my God, okay, now I can breathe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Hadi. No it was an amazing presentation. Thank I you for I, yeah. all the energy and and the good examples. I really like the presentation. I know. Yeah. It's eye opening presentation. So it's great. Thank you, Hali. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know that you okay. guys had a good time. Yeah. Uh, well, then, Liz, everybody, see you later. Thank you, Hali. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. See you next yeah. Wednesday. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Take care.